I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18 is our text. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. They look amazingly like mine. And turn to page 979 and you will find our text uh, in Matthew 18. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Um, I don't know if you guys are excited about this week, but it is a gloriously uh, wonderful week of opportunity for us. Uh, uh, you, you heard Mitch talk about uh, Halloween, right? Anybody excited about Halloween? All right. All right let's, let's, let's get real honest. How many of you going to dress up for Halloween? Halloween? Uh, okay. Some of you need to get in the spirit a little bit more, right? Okay, I don't really care if you dress up, but I do care if you show up down on Main Street and help us out. Uh, as uh, Mitch mentioned, we've got about 40 more uh, volunteers that we need to make out the, the evening, so it's fun for everyone, including the volunteers that come down. Uh, we're especially needing some volunteers for the late shift, which is 7 to 9. I know for some of you, 9 is the new midnight, but, uh, but you know, uh, you can make it happen. But uh, we, we still need some more help just so we have plenty of people covering the games. And, uh, and we could always use more candy. I don't know if you guys know this, but we expanded our Halloween ministry events. We've already done two nights out at the mall at their Trunk or Treat. We've got two events in Parker uh, and Main Street. So uh, keep bringing the candy. Uh, it's never enough. It's never enough. We might actually have to, like, count out the pieces that we give this year. So uh, that would be a tragedy, wouldn't it? And, uh, and then the week ends with Compassion Experience next weekend. Uh, and this just kind of fell into our laps and was a wonderful gift, surprise. They called us up and said, can you guys host it? You guys did such a great job a few years ago, and uh, the church we had canceled on us, and, and so we're hosting it. And this is an incredible experience for you to go through, but also we need some volunteers. And uh, if you need any information about that, stop by the main uh, lobby connection center afterwards, see me or see Amber Smith, our serve coordinator, and we'll get some information for you, tell you how you can sign up online, all that. So uh, exciting things are going on, and I hope you can be a part of that. Plus, it's just fun seeing all the kids dressed up getting candy. It's just a blast to know that we get to uh, represent Jesus and sugar kids up at the same time. <laughs> and I know some of you are wondering, if I volunteer, can I sample? Yes, you can. Okay? If you're serving, you can eat candy. Okay? That's the edict. Hey, uh, when someone needs to confront you, when someone needs to tell you something that you really don't want to hear, isn't pleasant, isn't fun, whatever that case may be, uh, do you want them to be subtle and gentle, or do you want them to be direct and straightforward? Okay, so let's, let's find out how many want. How many of you want the gentle, kind of subtle approach? Okay, it's a lot of hands. How many of you want the straightforward, direct approach? Oh, a lot more hands. Okay. Well, this is the sermon for you then. Because Jesus is confrontational, sort of in the biblical baseball bat sort of way, uh, with an issue that every single one of us deals with. Every single one of us has to fight through this. And we're talking about forgiveness. We're talking about mercy. And, and it begins, this passage begins with a question from the Apostle Peter, who simply is asking, hey Jesus, how forgiving do I have to be? How merciful do I need to be? toward people who have wronged me. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. Uh, we're going to read through the end of the chapter. Then Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Now, understand that Peter was being magnanimous at that point because the standard answer for the day among the Pharisees was three times. So like, you know, Double plus one, you know, seven times. And uh, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. 
But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Jesus wants us to understand mercy. And, and it begins with that question from Peter. And we need to understand mercy because this is one of the key, one of the essential elements of following Jesus Christ. And, and how we respond to Jesus' teachings, how we incorporate them into our lives, how we live them out, uh, really determines how we live our lives. I, I really want you to understand that, that how you answer this question of how merciful am I going to be is going to determine how you live your life in, in really every facet of every relationship. So let's look at this text. Let's look at this story and, and see if we can figure it out because the first radical idea that Jesus introduces is that God forgives. God forgives. It, now, if it wasn't already obvious, the king in the story represents God. A king, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants and, and he gathers them together. And, uh, and the king in the story forgives. He forgives completely and incredibly. Grace is available to the servant because he asks for it. And, and, and this is the very heart of the gospel. This is the very heart of the good news that I do not have to pay for my sins. That mercy is available. And by the way, if you think, well, I can pay for my sins, you can't. Even if you tried, you can't pay for your sins. How do I know this? Because we are represented by this servant in here that owed 10,000 talents. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't travel in the currency of talents. You know, we think of talent like, you know, America's got talent. Right? You know, we think of that as a skill or ability. What the musicians did up here, that's talent. You know, somebody doing a backflip and throwing the first pitch, that's talent. You know, whatever. But we think in terms of, of talents. That's not what this word represents. Okay? Talent is a measure of money used in the ancient world. Okay? And, and it basically, one talent represented 15 years of the average person's pay. That's how much money it was. So I did a little bit of math. Because uh, I want us to understand what this means in today's dollars. So I just took minimum wage in Arizona, which right now is $11 an hour. It's going to be $12 an hour in January, but right now it's $11 an hour. That's the minimum wage. So if you work full time at $11 an hour, one talent, 15 years times, you know, $11 an hour times 40 hours a week times 52 weeks a year comes out to $343,000. One talent. You know, 10,000 talents. Do you know what that equates to? How about $3.4 trillion with a T? Trillion. Okay? That's what 10,000 talents means in today's economy. $3.4 trillion. By the way, the richest man in the world as of Google yesterday uh, was uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon. $112 billion. In other words, he's one-fourth of the 0.4 trillion. Yeah, he can't even touch it. Richest man in the world. In other words, this debt is unpayable. It's impossible. And this is a picture of grace. This is a picture of mercy, and it's crazy. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's unimaginable. It's breathtaking. Think about this. This, this, is, this is God's forgiveness for us. We offended God. We offended God by rebelling against him, by ignoring his wisdom, by defying his leadership, by rejecting him as master of our lives. And what did he do? He paid our debt by sacrificing his son for us. 
The same Apostle Peter in his first letter that he wrote, 1 Peter chapter 1, says, For we were not redeemed with perishable things such as silver or gold from the empty way of life handed down to us by our forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. God paid your debt through Jesus' life. Let me say that again. God paid your debt, my debt, through the sacrifice of Jesus. And, and this entire idea of grace is foreign to how we think. I mean, it, it really, we don't travel in grace naturally. By the way, that's why so many people, even in church, have a problem with grace. I mean, let's be honest. We sing about amazing grace. Every generation has got an amazing grace song. But so often we don't live it. We don't live it at all. I mean, again, some people, and I've grown up in church, so I've seen this my whole life, they, they, they want to seem like they, they think, I've got to ration grace. I've got to give it out in small doses. Here you can have a teaspoon of grace. There's enough grace for you because your sins aren't really bad. Your sins are like mine. There's enough grace for that, but you, you're a mess. Your sins are way too big. And we treat people like that, like God's grace isn't enough. And, and I want you to see the story that God forgives incredibly immensely beyond comprehension he is willing to forgive so god's grace is limitless you let me just put it this way you do not have the power to out sin god's grace some of you have tried and you failed okay he offers a thousand second chances and his grace is for you his mercy is for you the forgiveness is for you and some of you really struggle to believe that God forgives you. I mean, you believe that God forgives people. You believe that if anyone else asks God to forgive them, that he'll do that. But when it comes to you, you're not so sure. You think you've somehow failed worse than other people. You think somehow you, you've made a mess of your life so that God's grace can't abound to you, and you're still trying to pay for your sins because you think you're worse than everybody else. Can I just tell you the truth? We're all a mess. Person sitting to your right, to your left, they're a mess. Person sitting between them, you're a mess. We're a mess. I mean, we really are. And, and, and we just need to go ahead and recognize that. Nobody's got their act together. Nobody is, is a good person. Scripture even says that. No one is righteous, not even one. So we're all in the same boat. We need forgiveness, but all you see is your sin, and you think, hey, I, I still got to pay for it. And listen, I'm all about repentance and making amends, but you don't have to pay for it. You can't pay for it. And the good news is, you are completely forgiven. God, God is crazy with mercy. He is indiscriminate, abundant, and joyful with His grace. On one condition. That one condition. You guys know what that one condition is? you got to ask for it. Isn't that what the, mercy, the, the, the servant did before the master? He fell down and begged for mercy, and he got mercy. The apostle John, who's also there, said, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. If we confess. If we confess. Um, so if we ask, God forgives if you ask, God forgives. This is amazing grace. It's the first radical truth in this story. Second radical truth in this story is God's people forgive. God's people forgive. Don't you love the question, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Oh, I'm going to be really good. Seven times? <laughs> no. You know what the answer is? Beyond count. Don't keep score. 77 times? Aren't you going to get confused somewhere around 34, 35? <laughs> How many times? I can't remember. I can't get, now, there are some of you that are record keepers. You'd have it right. But that's not the point. The point is, stop keeping track. Beyond count. Just, just forgive. And, and, he, and he says it. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ forgave you. How did God in Christ forgive you? Completely. Completely. Isn't that what Jesus told in the story? I mean, I mean, just look back at what the servant 
or the, the master said to the servant in verse 32 and 33, it says, Then the master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? You see, that's the standard that, that God's people forgive. Now understand, we don't forgive in order to be forgiven. We're not earning forgiveness by forgiving people. We forgive because we've been forgiven. We forgive because we've experienced mercy, and because we've experienced mercy, because we know our sins are forgiven, then we can forgive other people. Because grace flows through us. We receive it from God and we give it to others. If you don't receive it from God, you can't really give it to others. But if you're receiving mercy, then you give mercy. So, I just want you to understand, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin, you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you're forgiven. God's mercy is poured out on you, and even though you deserve hell, because you earned it, the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Even though you deserve hell, you get heaven because of God's mercy. And because you've received that mercy, you can't wait to pour it out on other people just to give them that grace and mercy that you have received because your debt has been paid. The $3.4 trillion is erased. I think you can let go of the $250 the other guy owes you. Right? See, when you do the math, you go, oh yeah, that makes sense. So why is it so hard in life? God forgave us, so we forgive others. Which brings us to the tension in the story. Because the tension in the story is the action of the unmerciful servant. I mean, how could he do this? How could he be forgiven of all this debt, 10,000 talents, $3.4 trillion, and not forgive the other guy? The other guy didn't know him chump change, by the way. It wasn't like a $20 debt. Uh, if you figure it out, the denarii, 100 denarii, it's probably about two months' wages, maybe three months' wages. It was not small potatoes. It was a serious debt. But how did he not forgive that when he'd been forgiven greatly? Now, here's my answer, because this stumped me for years. I look at this and go, how could the guy be that stupid? Okay? I don't know what you're thinking, but I'm going, this guy's brainless. He just doesn't get it. And that's the point. He didn't get it. He didn't understand grace. And because he didn't understand grace, he didn't give grace. Go back and look at the details of the story and look at the request. In verse 26, I actually pick up verse 25. So since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children, all that he had in payment to be made. You're talking about debtor's prison. So he's going to be sold as slaves and whatever he would have made, that would be paid back toward his debt. And verse 26, so the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, what? listen to this, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. He didn't ask for his debt to be forgiven. What did he ask for? He wanted an extension. He wanted more time. Give me more time and I'll make it good. But the king forgave the debt. And then it occurred to me, this guy didn't understand grace. He didn't understand that he'd been forgiven of all of his sins. He thought he had to go out and collect $3.4 trillion. And so the guy who owed him five hundred, dollars he had to go beat it out of him. Right? Isn't that, that explains the actions. If you don't understand grace, then you don't get grace. He never, he never grasped the reality of forgiveness. Which brings us to the moral of the story. When we understand grace, we extend grace. When we understand grace, we extend grace. The people of God forgive because we understand that all of our sins have been forgiven. And I grasped the reality that my actions, my choices, my decisions qualified me for hell. But because of Jesus' death and resurrection, I am guaranteed heaven. I do not deserve it. I'm getting way better than what I deserve. And that's because of Jesus. That's mercy. That's the story. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And the people of God forgive because that's what our Savior did. Right? 
Jesus, when they were nailing him to the cross, what did he say? Father, condemn them? No. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Forgive them. That's the example that we have. That's the message we have. We forgive because it is a family value, a core conviction that is central to following Jesus. This is essential to our identity as Jesus followers. God forgives. God's people forgive. So I have two questions that I want to ask you, and, and I want you to wrestle with them. I want you to wrestle with them today. I want you to wrestle with them this week. I want you to wrestle with them until you really come to that place of understanding. Uh, the first question is for everybody, everyone who's here. And it is simply this. Have you received mercy? Have you personally received mercy? mercy do you understand that your debt is canceled everything that you owe god all the rebellion in your life all the ridiculously stupid choices you made and i know there's kids in here you're not supposed to use the word stupid but let's face it we have been idiots with our choices all of those all of the defiance all of the 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 hatred you've spewed, spewed out toward god or towards other people all of the self-destructive things you've done, all the things you've done to hurt other people, all of it is canceled through Jesus. He paid that price. He paid that for you. You no longer serve or give or attend trying to repay your debt. If you understand grace, then you serve and give and attend because your debt is paid. In other words... Let me just ask you this. Are you living out of obligation or are you living out of gratitude? Are you living out of obligation? Obligation means that, well, you're always complaining because stuff just isn't quite right. How come we don't do it like we used to? Hey, could you turn down the music? It's too loud. And what about those lights? I don't like them moving around when we're singing. And what's with the smoke? <laughs> By the way, it's not smoke, it's haze, which means it's 100% water. I know, so some of you swear you're allergic to it, but you're not allergic to water. I checked. It's impossible. <laughs> you're not allergic to water if you try to breathe it. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you're, compla you're complaining about other people. Did you see what they did? I think that you start judging their, their intentions. I know what you meant by that. We, we just complain about life. We, you know, nothing's good enough because, you know, oh, man, they're asking for volunteers again. I can't believe it. I guess I got to show up so you know, I can serve and get some credit toward my debt. <laughs> Look, I grew up with a lot of people who did church out of obligation. Their whole Christian life was one of duty. It wasn't one of joy. And if that's you, if that's what's going through your mind, then you need to grasp grace. You need to understand grace. You need to receive grace. Because we want you to live in gratitude. When you've received mercy, you live in gratitude because you just, you're like, I'm living in joy. I'm thankful for the blessings. I, I mean, I'm ready to, to give the benefit of the doubt. I'm ready to give people the second chance. I, I, I want to celebrate life change. I want to encourage others. You have the attitude of, I get to do this. I mean, you're the one that we talked about needing volunteers. You nudged your, your spouse and said, hey, what are we doing Thursday night? What do you mean watching football? No, let's go. I know the Cardinals are playing. Sorry. I didn't make the schedule. So, you know, what, what is it that, you know, you, the attitude that your life is showing, what is it all about? You see, God wants you to receive mercy. Mercy is available. All you have to do is ask. And so if you haven't received mercy, it begins with a request. I already told you what 1 John 1, 9 says. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive your sins and purify you of all unrighteousness. All of it. Romans 10, 9, uh, the Apostle Paul says, If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. If you're sitting here and, and you've just been going through the motions, you've been acting out of obligation, you've been hoping to repay your debt, I want you to know mercy. I want you to receive mercy. And in just a moment, I'm going to invite you just to, to pray with me and, and just commit yourself to Jesus and ask him to pour out his mercy on you. 
But I also know there's people here who believe in Jesus, who've, who've confessed Jesus as Lord. You know that you're going to heaven, but there's still a lot of obligation in your heart. And you're not living in the fullness of God's grace and mercy. And God wants you to get it. He wants you to get it. He doesn't want you trying to repay the debt that he already paid. He doesn't want you living out of that place where you think you owe him something. You owe him everything, but he doesn't want you living out of obligation. He wants you living out of love. And I just want to pray for you in just a moment. If that's you, that, that God would just reveal his mercy to you in a new way. So if you're in either one of those places, if you just need God's mercy to fill your life, or, or if you really haven't ever tasted it and you want to commit yourself to Jesus the first time, you just pray with me right now. Father, your mercy is amazing. And I pray for those who have never surrendered them, themselves to you, that right now you would reveal yourself to them and they would say yes to Jesus and they would receive your mercy and they would accept that payment of Jesus' blood for their sins and they would understand that, that you forgive them and you love them and you want to offer them life. And Father, for your children that are still living in guilt and shame and, and obligation, I pray that tonight would be the day that you set them free and you just pour out your grace in their life and they would experience that forgiveness, that cleansing, that wholeness of God like never before. Because you're a God who forgives. And we desperately need your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you had never prayed for God to take your life and for you to receive mercy, would you see us after the service? Share with one of our prayer team members here at the front. Come find one of the pastors. We would love to, to celebrate with you the life change that you are experiencing in Jesus Christ. So please come find us. Now, second question, and, and honestly, this is for followers of Jesus. Uh, the expectations are for followers of Jesus, so this question is for followers of Jesus. Are you being merciful? Are you being merciful? And no, the church answer doesn't qualify. Because you all know what you're supposed to say, right? Of course, we forgive everybody. Honestly, are there people in your life that you are bitter, angry, and unforgiving toward? And see right now, you know the test? Did somebody's face just pop into your mind? Some of you have a list, like the post office. We're talking about people who have hurt you, who have betrayed you, who have wounded and wronged you. Maybe someone who abused you or cheated on you or abandoned you or stole from you. I mean, maybe it's a parent that you're angry at, a child, a sibling, or an ex. What is your response to them? You see, bitterness is poison to your soul. Uh, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. That's not original with me, but it's a great illustration. It, it's it just hatred and revenge and anger robs you of joy. So honestly, do you relate to the unmerciful servant in the story? Are there people that you want to choke the life out of and throw them in prison? You see, if so, then Jesus' counsel is for you to forgive and to pray for them. Jesus in Matthew 5 says this, and, and, and these are words that, that hurt, but they're also words that heal. He said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Kind of sounds like that's what we do as a family of God. We forgive. And the way we forgive is we intentionally pray for those people who have hurt us, who we're angry at, who there's that bitterness in our hearts, in our souls. And this is not easy because you're not praying, God, let them get in an accident. You're not praying, God, let your justice fall on them like a hammer. You're not even allowed to pray, for, God, please let them get explosive diarrhea in a traffic jam. Okay? Okay? You're praying kind of the prayer I just prayed for you. God, show them your mercy. Show them your grace. Let them experience your love. Change their heart. Now, 
When you start praying for them, you may not mean it. That's okay. Because you're being obedient to God. And he delights in your obedience. And you know what he'll do? He'll meet you there in your obedience. And he'll begin cleansing your heart of that anger and that unforgiveness and that bitterness. And when you start praying for them, your blood pressure will go up and your hands will clench. Your teeth will grit. But after a week or a month or a year or a decade, all that will go away. Look, I'm not saying how long it's going to take. I'm just saying it's a process and God will heal. But you've got to be obedient and say, hey, I want to be merciful. God, teach me to forgive. And he will. Forgiveness doesn't abrogate judgment. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you let him get away with it. Forgiveness means that you step into the freedom that God has for you. See, forgiveness is for you. The mercy is for you. It's to bless you. And forgiveness cleanses and heals your soul. And forgiveness breathes life and joy into your relationships. And forgiveness opens the floodgates of God's blessings so that you can live a completely different life in every relationship, at every point. So God forgives. And God's people forgive. So I want to challenge you to embrace and to celebrate your forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, we, we don't deserve to be forgiven. We don't have any right to demand or to claim your mercy, but we gladly receive it because it is a gift that you have given to us through Jesus Christ. And tonight we confess the anger, the bitterness, the rage, the, the vengeance, the, just the, all that filth that's in our souls because we haven't let go of it. And we, we just acknowledge that it's destroying us and not them. So God, teach us how to forgive so that you can bless us and in turn we can bless them. Teach us how to forgive so that we can live in the glorious joy of your mercy and we can give it to others and experience more of your grace and your redemptive power in our lives. But give us the courage to begin that journey by opening up our lives to your mercy and your grace. Help us to stop living out of obligation and help us to live out of gratitude as children of the living God who always forgives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.